Hello, everyone. Uh, we are here to talk about the Courier Kubernetes, so please check that you're in the right room. <laughs> Uh, my name is Irena Berezovsky, and here is uh, Tony Sigura Pomidon. Uh, we both are uh, part of the uh, Courier team, and we are here to talk about the recent addition to the Courier portfolio, the integration with this, with the one of the most popular container orchestration engines, which is Kubernetes. I'll provide a short info to this uh, a project, introduce you to the currently supported functionality and explain about the overall architecture. And then Tony will dive into much more detail, detailed explanation of the integration we did and will uh, show you the demo uh, how uh, the uh, neutron networking can serve the Kubernetes cluster. So what was the motivation for uh, this project? With uh, cloud native workloads and uh, microservices based applications that uh, gradually take place of the VM based on monolithic applications, uh, we see that there is uh, different options that popping up. There are different container orchestration engines such as Kubernetes that uh, try to provide solution for them. But if you want to deploy uh, your uh, containers aside existing OpenStack VM deployment, these options uh, currently doesn't provide a proper answer. Uh, even though Kubernetes is quite extendable platform and there are uh, many options that you can put uh, different network providers uh, uh, to support the Kubernetes networking, these options are usually limited to the container-based uh, environment. So you need to figure out how you can put your bare metal or uh, VM parts, uh, if they need to be part of your application uh, on uh, this network. And usually there is no uh, unified network that can serve this. Uh, in, in case where uh, some uh, better uh, security and isolation between tenants is required, uh, the way to do it is to deploy containers inside virtual machines and then each tenant gets its uh, uh, own virtual machines that can deploy uh, the containers inside, but then you end up with networking layers that connects virtual machines and another networking layer that connects uh, containers. And uh, this actually has uh, two major problems. One is uh, degradation in uh, latency and bandwidth. This part can be resolved with some technical solutions, but more severe problems that we see is the management problem because now the operator will have to deal uh, also um, not only with one orchestration system and troubleshoot and debugging and monitoring, but uh, actually with two, one that connects the virtual machines and another that connects uh, your containers. With Neutron, we actually see that it can be the unified platform that can uh, provide good solution for the case that you have mixed environments, uh, that you have virtual machines or bare metals, and you want to add containers to, to these uh, uh, applications. With uh, options uh, uh, that we currently explore with uh, Fushi Kubernetes, it will allow to add storage to the bare metal Kubernetes clusters, which will quite complete this solution and will allow to support also the neutron-based networking and Manila or Cinder-based storage in the Kubernetes cluster. So what is the mission of this uh, project? With all these challenges that we see in the containers environment, we believe that Neutron will be uh, able to provide the real unified platform to combine the VM-based, bare metal-based, and container-based workload in uh, under, under one networking solution. And uh, it will actually allow the smooth transition to the containerized world, and we see it already happens in OpenStack, where OpenStack services are get containerized and orchestrated by Kubernetes. It will allow both VM and containers to share the same virtual topology and use either layer two or layer three uh, networking that will connect your VMs and uh, Kubernetes cluster. And if there are some existing applications that already deployed in your data center, 
um, and uh, in, in virtual machines and you want to transition to the microservices, you can do it on, the, on your own pace while rewriting certain parts of the application, keeping the rest in the VMs and take your time when you can combine part uh, of them in virtual machines and part of them in, uh, in the containers. So what are different use cases we are trying to cover? One use case is the, the bare metal, where uh, containers are deployed on physical machines. Uh, this use case is usually common when uh, people do care about performance, so you don't have additional layer of virtual machine where you uh, run your containers. In, in such case, uh, from the deployment point of view, what we'll have, we'll usually have the OpenStack controller node where all uh, the services of the OpenStack are running in the courier Kubernetes integration. The important services that we need are actually two of them, the Neutron server and uh, the Keystone. So there usually be the dedicated node that will host all the OpenStack uh, controller services. On the Kubernetes uh, master node, uh, in addition to the Neutron infrastructure, we'll have the major component, uh, the courier controller. I'll explain a little bit later what exactly it does, um, but the main purpose of it is just to bind and translate the uh, data model of the Kubernetes into the Neutron resources. And on each of the worker nodes, we'll have uh, the courier CNI, which uh, will be called by the Kubernetes Kubelet agent. And this guy will actually uh, do the real binding of the pods and uh, plug them into the host networking via the Neutron uh, infrastructure. Another use case that we support is uh, the nested case where we run the pods inside virtual machines. This case is uh, usually used when we need to have the tenant isolation. So as I mentioned before, uh, each tenant will be allocated with virtual machines and it, he will be able to deploy uh, its workloads uh, inside these virtual machines. Um, in, usually, for example, with OpenStack, you can deploy such cluster with Magnum. So in this case, we'll have uh, some uh, node to run the OpenStack services as before. And we'll have a one uh, compute node where we deploy the uh, courier uh, virtual machine, which is uh, actually belongs to administrators that will have courier controller component uh, that will have to go uh, and to connect to the Kubernetes API server and also to the Neutron server to, to do the translation of the model, but it will be actually the only point where we need access to these APIs. So from the uh, compute nodes uh, that host worker VMs, uh, there is no such component required, and the only thing that we'll need, uh, we'll need the courier CNI to be deployed uh, together with the kubelet agent. There are, of course, the mixed environments where there are some workloads that require containers, virtual machines, sometimes bare metals. So uh, this is also possible uh, with uh, the courier uh, Kubernetes integration. What we'll have in uh, this case, usually a number of uh, networks. So one will connect the VMs that host containers. And in case you use Magnum, so this network is usually will be deployed as part of the Kubernetes cluster. And we'll have additional networks that will connect the tenant uh, containers that running inside VM. Uh, and this is done by uh, trunking the containers port through the hosting uh, VM uh, port into uh, the network. So what the, uh, is the functionality that we support right now? Uh, first first uh, mode of the networking that we decided to support is the actually Kubernetes nat native uh, networking mode when all, there is one subnet and all pods are deployed on this subnet. So in case uh, uh, you will require some isolation, it should be achieved through the Kubernetes networking policies. We don't have isolation right now by the network or subnet uh, layer. Uh, so uh, there is uh, one single tenant 
and there is full connectivity, which is uh, enabled by, by default. We support the cluster IP service uh, type of the Kubernetes. Uh, the, this one is implemented uh, through the Neutron L uh, load balancer API. We disable the kube proxy and use Neutron load balancer abstraction and API just to go and support the Kubernetes services. Uh, our default uh, provider for this is HE proxy and we actually plan to move uh, to the Octavia in the next release. And uh, we support, of course, the bare metal and the nested uh, uh, cases uh, and the mixture of uh, different workloads if you have your bare metal, VMs, and nested containers. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, intro of the overall architecture that we have uh, in uh, Courier uh, Kubernetes. Uh, the main service and centralized service is the courier controller. Uh, this service is responsible to watch changes that happen in the Kubernetes uh, API. Uh, it watches for the changes uh, for events on the pods, on services, and on the service endpoints. Once there is some uh, new uh, pod service or endpoint uh, created or there are some modifications, Courier controller translates these changes into the Neutron model, so it either uh, allocates, uh, creates ports and allocates IP from the uh, cluster subnet. Um, in case of the services, it goes and creates load balancer, listener, and pool, and once there are some endpoints added because there are new pods added uh, to the replication through the replication controller that uh, attached to this service, so uh, it will also create the member in the Neutron uh, load balancer instance. Uh, the courier CNI component is essential part uh, that should be deployed on each uh, worker node. Uh, and this one, because there is such component on each worker node, we decided that from the integration point of view, uh, this component shouldn't have access to the Neutron API and keep the existing APIs uh, that already uh, there because uh, the kubelet is there. So uh, the courier CNI uh, can uh, get information through the two sources, either from the kubelet or the environment uh, where it's deployed, or it can get uh, the additional information in the instances uh, or entities uh, of, of the pods because the courier controller will annotate uh, with required information to do the local binding. So this will include the MAC address and the IP address and the port types that we'll need. So the courier CNI uh, will perform the local binding of the pod by creating the virtual uh, uh, interface pairs and then plug uh, one end of it into the uh, pod namespace and another one into the host networking stack through the neutron infrastructure. Uh, we use two uh, essential uh, OpenStack services, uh, Neutron and Keystone, Keystone for authentication and communicate uh, with Neutron through the Neutron client. And we also try to use as much as possible various uh, open, uh, OpenStack services uh, in our integration. So we use Oslo config for uh, the configuration management. Um, and versioned objects to keep the format uh, of the annotations uh, that, uh, that we uh, propagate uh, from the controller to the CNI. So this will allow much easier uh, uh, rollbacks and upgrades and uh, it, uh, it helps in case you need to upgrade the version of, uh, of your deployment. Um, a bit uh, about how we translate the Kubernetes service. So in the native Kubernetes implementation, there is kube proxy that uses uh, IP, table, uh, IP tables uh, to, to program the required rules to do the load balancing. We, because we have the Neutron backends, we actually don't need this component, so this component is disabled. And we can uh, choose whatever component is there to uh, support the Neutron Load Balancer API. Uh, for now, we have HE Proxy. Uh, in the future, we plan to move to Octavia. 
And from the translation point of view, so in a Kubernetes service, there is usually cluster IP, which is mapped to the virtual IP in the neutron load balancer language. We use the same subnet that uh, Kubernetes uh, defines for the cluster IP range, and this subnet is used for the VIP allocations. So once there is new service uh, created, there will be pool created in Neutron with a listener, and then for every pod uh, that uh, belongs to this service, uh, there will be member added in the Neutron uh, balancer instance. So now I'll pass it to Tony. All right, so I'm going to give you a bit of a deep dive just to get about the feeling of, of, the, of the room. Uh, how many of you have tried uh, Kubernetes? That's a very good show of hands. And Courier Kubernetes, just in case? Okay, we have a couple, that's good. All right, so let's get started with this. As Irene said, there is the, the Courier Controller. Uh, the Courier Controller, I'll spare you the details. This is something that Irene already said. Maybe I'll add some information uh, that Thanks to Steve Dorr, which is also an OpenStack project, we are completely pluggable. So if you were to say, okay, I like what Courier Kubernetes does, but for example, I want to do something extra for the ports, or I want to use this other uh, load balancer application that I have, or some uh, provider that has, I don't know, uh, some hardware that also integrates with Neutron, as long as it plays nice with the Neutron ports, you could do that, or you could even trash our drivers, so there's, you can uh, change the, how it sees the events and what it does with the events. So in that sense, you could say, okay, so I want to just not use Neutron at all, and uh, use ODL or, or straight some SDN. You could do that just changing and making your own modules available in the system and pointing to them with Steve Dorr. So, in this sense, it is very pluggable. Sometimes we think it's a bit too much pluggable, and you don't know which things play with each other, so we're gonna have a feature there that is gonna say, okay, this is the vanilla configuration, and it will load all the drivers that play well with each other. And yeah, finally, we use OSB for the, for the interface plugging. So the way, the contract between the controller and the CNI component of Courier is, uh, the beef, the, the OS beef objects, this uh, standard OpenStack. And the good thing about that is, if you were to say, I only, I'm interested in the CNI part, you could make your uh, pod creations already include the beef information, and Queer CNI would already pick that up, and, it, and you would not even need to run the controller. But you should, it's a, it's a nice project. So this is a bit, uh, with 1.6, Kubernetes uh, role-based access control became very important. And this is what I use for the demo. Uh, yes, I, I, I cut it down because I had some extra permissions for some open, open shift objects that I removed last minute. Uh, and basically, this is what the controller needs. And as you can see, what it does the most is to get and watch objects and the ones that we really use now are the pods, the services, and the endpoints. But I added some more in case we will want to do something. For example, somebody from Samsung sent a, a patch about SRIOV so that if you want to manage a pool, you could, for example, use the node object and put information in the node object about which virtual functions are available. So that's why it is there. It's not used now. And then in terms of patching, which is what we do to, uh, so that the CNI finds the information that the controller put. We put all those resources, but mostly we use uh, pod services and endpoints as well. And uh, service status is a special object that allows you to implement a load balancer type so that uh, when you have a service that you want to make available outside of the cluster, you, uh, you use the load balancer type and then it will get a, in our case, we implement that with a floating IP or we will implement it because it's only been uh, prototyped. All right, so th for the CNI part, uh, this is a bit to give you uh, on, on the left-hand side, wait, 
your right hand side, uh, there is uh, the information that the CNI expects to find. This is, I cut some of the versioning information because otherwise it was like three pages long. But you can see that it has all the information needed for, for a VIF, for a virtual interface. And uh, the thing is, when it runs on bare, on bare metal, and, and I'm going to show a very detailed flow, it uh, needs this information to perform the OVS binding or OVN or Dragonflow and whatnot. So as long as it can bind with Nova, it should be able to bind with uh, Courier Kubernetes. We support uh, CNI 0.3.0, and as long as, an, as soon as another one comes out, we'll support it. And if, by default, we'll output the latest one, but if the kubelet asks an older one, we're able to convert it ourselves, so it's, that's fine. And, and the way that it works now, it just, the kubelet calls the CNI, it's an executable, it watches the, the Kubernetes API, and once it sees the, the annotation put by the controller, it can already proceed. But let's uh, look a bit about the permissions. As you can see, since it cannot really, uh, it doesn't need to change any information, it only needs to, to get and list. All right, so let's look with more detail. I hope I will not bore you too much with details, but let's, let's go a bit through the flow so you understand how this all works. So the user creates a pod. Courier Control and, and Kubelet are applications that their main business is watching what, the, what happens in, at the API level, what the user defines. And the result of creating the pod is that events are sent out to all the watchers. So in parallel, the Courier Controller and Kubelet will perform uh, their duties. So the Kubelet will create the, the infrastructure container and then it will ask CNI, it will call CNI in order to get it networked and wait for it to return. So in the meantime, the Courier Controller will be creating the Neutron port. It will uh, then check the port, get the port information, annotate and put it on the Kubernetes API server with a patch request. That will trigger another modified event that will be picked by the Courier CNI, which at this, this point is already watching for the beef information. And then it will call the plug uh, method. And that will trigger the OVS uh, agent, if you're using the reference implementation, to uh, start the dance of getting the information from, from Neutron to perform the binding and set up the flows and so on. And once the controller sees that um, the port is active. You, you see there that you have like a loop that is showing port all the time until it sees that it's active. Once it sees that, it annotates saying it is active, and then the Courier CNI will return control to, uh, to the kubelet. It will finish its job, and then uh, the pod can already work, and we guarantee, because it is active, that, the, that no packets will be lost because of it not being ready. And you, if you're paying attention, you will say, okay, there's a bit of, uh, of a big amount of round trips here. We're aware of it. And the way we're solving that is we're gonna pull resources. We have some patches in flight for that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have already bound ports in uh, the computer, uh, in the worker nodes of Kubernetes so that when you need a resource, the controller will just say, use this one of the pool. And then the Courier CNI will just move it inside the container and this is done. All right. So now, if we look at what happens when the Kubernetes cluster runs inside Nova instances, and this is a very important use case for us because we want to make OpenStack the best platform to run Kubernetes on, and its derivatives, of course. Uh, what we use for that, by default, is uh, Neutron Trunk Ports. This started with Okada. And what it does is basically, this is what you usually have. Uh, but as you can see, there is a bridge that probably you're not familiar with there in the middle. It's called the trunk bridge. And you see that the tap device, instead of being attached to the VR int, is attached to this uh, bridge. And the reason why is because this port has been made uh, a trunk port, which means that it can be split into several um, Supports and parent ports. So the, the L0 
it's on VLAN zero, so it gets split into that trunk port that you have in purple there. And when you start launching pods, what happens is even if the pods are in the same network, uh, they get different VLANs. What this means is that in the trunk bridge, they will be able to be split into separate, uh, separate ports. There you have the turquoise, gr uh, green, I don't know, and the pink. Sorry for the cl color choice, it's a bit bad. But, uh, and then you, what you can see there is that on the upper side, you see the pod has a device that comes with a VLAN tag. Uh, then in the middle layer, you can see that that VLAN tag is stripped and they are separated into internal ports of that bridge that are used to patch to the OVS VR int. And there you already have the regular subnets that you're all familiar with that are corresponding to the subnets. What this means is that when a pod wants to talk to another pod, it will still go all the way to VR int, even if they're running on the same VM. And this allows you to apply things like policy between pods that are running on the same subnet. And, and, and this is something that with other implementations that we have, you could get rid of, but if you would need a security group model that would have this requirement, it would allow you to do that. If there is any question at any point, because this is the deep dive part, really, just go to the, to the microphone and ask. I, I'm willing to spend the necessary time for everybody to, to be confident of their knowledge on this. So this is how it looks like when you're creating uh, pods inside Nova instances. So you can see it looks almost the same. The difference is that when the port is created, automatically afterwards, you can see that it does allocate VLAN ID. And this means that it checks which VLAN IDs are being used on that Nova instance at zero. It will select another one so of the 4096 that are available and it will add the port to the, to the trunk, the new port that it created, it will add it to the trunk with that VLAN ID, and then it will wait uh, for the uh, trunk service of Neutron. So in your Neutron deployment, you have to enable the trunk service, which by default usually doesn't come enabled, so remember to do that, otherwise you will spend time like me figuring out what is going on. And uh, once that is done, the port is active and it will send the annotation that it is active and courier CNI can return. But as you can see on the, on the courier CNI uh, side, this time we don't need to perform any plugging because it's just creating a VLAN device and that's all. Okay, so now, as Irena said, with this release we added service to port. And the flow is, again, since this is our architecture, it's a bit similar, but it doesn't involve CNI, obviously, this time. What it does is, it sees that, that the service is created and logically endpoints follow. Uh, and with information about that, it will create the load balancer, wait for the load balancer to be up, so there's some polling there. So it's also a candidate for making a pool of load balancers so you can use them faster when you need them. Then it will create a listener, and listeners, we just use them very plainly, like just for a port. If we, when you will support uh, ingress control, sorry, ingress uh, objects in, in Kubernetes, then we'll probably use them with the layer seven policies to be able to differentiate between paths and so on, but for now it's just plain listener, the pool, and then for each endpoint, that every time we see a change on endpoints, we check that the list that we have in the members and the list that we get from endpoints match and we remove and add whatever is necessary. All right, so as I said, there is this work going on thanks to the, the, the folks uh, from the super, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, so the, the question was if uh, we are doing the load balancing for all the endpoints, uh, sorry, for the endpoints or the external endpoints? The answer is it's for the, this is just for the services to work and, and with the bots, so it's for all the endpoints. And the external ones, the ones you would put with external IP, would be processed separately by having a floating IP assigned to them. This is something that we don't do yet. We don't have support for external IP because most people were just 
wanting to use the load balancer type, but if people would come up and say, look, we would want to support external IP, we would, we would also add that uh, without much cost to the flow that we saw before. Thank you for the question. Uh, so the superfluidity folks are interested in um, deployments that are side by side, OpenStack, Kubernetes, and Kubernetes using uh, neutral networking. And they are interested in uh, creation, that the creation goes very fast of the resources. So the current uh, state of things where you need to go to neutral many times and so on, it's, it's not something that, that is satisfactory for anybody, but they care a lot about it. So they uh, send some patches, as I said, they already work. We're just bike shedding a bit about how they <laughs> should look like. But you can see the performance difference between how it is in Potim VM now to create uh, 50 containers and how it is once you have the resources pulled. And, and the difference is like uh, almost eightfold uh, better with the, with the pool resources. We hope that this will be available uh, in Pike. However, we'll see. It, it's, it's almost ready to merge. Yes, go ahead. Uh, this doesn't depend on anything special from, so the pod in VM part, yes, it needs uh, Okada, but the resource part, it could work even with earlier releases. Uh, so the, the, to get the pooling, you will need uh, only for courier the, the Pike release. For Newton, you will be able to use all the releases. Newton, for pot in VM, it will not work because of the lack of trunk ports unless you use, uh, we have some people from Intel sem submitting a patch so that instead of using Neutron trunk ports, it will use allowed IP addresses and Mac VLAN devices. And in that case, you would be able to use Newton even with the, with the pooling. And, and the way that we're doing the, you have more questions? Ah, okay, so thanks. Uh, and the way that we're doing this is we're doing it in a burst uh, tolerant way. So if you have the typical use case of nine in the morning, everybody gets to the office and starts firing services and containers. And let's say that you have a pool of 50 and suddenly you have 100 containers be created. So what we do is we, uh, double the amount of, of staff, and as they get less and less used, we clean up and reduce the size of the pool again. But we don't aggressively try to keep the pool at the same size. So if you have a lot of uh, of churn of containers, we can uh, we should be able to keep up with that. All right. So we get to the time of the demo. Here you have two options. You can ask me to run the demo live, and I will pray to the demo gods. <laughs> Or we can have a recording. Anyway, if the live one would fail, we could have the recorded one, and it's exactly the same deployment. So the deployment that I did was two uh, bare metal servers. You can see them as R510.02 on R510.03. The one 510.03 was deployed with Packstack. It is Okada. And there you have the typical stuff that, that gets deployed with Packstack, like Glance, Nova, Cinder, Neutron, Keystone, uh, and all that jazz. Um, then on the other one, I added it as a work, as a compute node afterwards. And then I created, uh, I used a project called Courier Heat that we are incubating, and then it will move inside Courier Kubernetes. So I used uh, some heat resources to be able to create the VMs and the trunk ports and so on, so I wouldn't have to call create them one by one, one by one. And then we have uh, the, I don't know, how many people are familiar with the Kubernetes guest book example application? Okay, some people. So it's, it's a ba basic application that it's a uh, two tire application. It has a front end that it's some JavaScript with PHP to decide, to, to find uh, the backend services it uses PHP, but otherwise it's JavaScript. And then underneath, uh, as a storage, it has re uh, Redis. It has a master and as many slaves as you want. So let's let's get that going. So, do you want me to try to run it live? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, wait. Somehow it went. Uh, 
Right. All right. So I'm in the right machine. Is it, do you think I should make it bigger? A little bit. Okay. Like this? Bigger? People in the back? Is it okay, this size? Okay, cool. So I have this script that sends the commands for me, but it's happening live. I'm just uh, too tired to remember all the commands by heart. And this is actually the same that will be posted on YouTube afterwards. And it has some explanations about what it's doing. But I already made those explanations earlier. Uh, this is about, I'm writing like this is just the picture that you saw before. When I'm going to edit on YouTube, I'm going to make an overlay here, fancy web showing the diagram at the same time. Uh, and also giving details about what I used, uh, that it was Packstack. I want to tell you that I'm going to make a blog post about this so you can uh, do it at home. And, uh, but the big important thing is after running Packstack, you should make sure that your OBS, fire, uh, so that your firewall driver for Neutron is OBS because otherwise uh, with a hybrid driver, there is some problem with the trunk port that the communication doesn't go anywhere. And you're going to keep wondering three hours if you're like me, what is going on. All right, so yeah, here I'm going to show the guestbook application. So typically the guestbook application comes with uh, three services and uh, each service, I think, the front end and the Redis and slaves are in three replicas. But since I was, uh, I was using a machine that was not very powerful, I reduced to one replica and then we'll scale so that you can see that scale still works. All right. So yeah, here, as you can see, I modified it to one replica, but otherwise it's exactly the same application. Um, one difference that there is here is since I'm not running kubeDNS, you could run kubeDNS, I just chose not to. So I changed, near the bottom you can see there the value env. That means that in order to find the services, uh, instead of using the DNS resolution, it's just checking the my environment variables that the kubelet sets uh, about the services. So let's clear that. So yeah, the, the subnets that we use for this demo are three. One is for the uh, pod subnet, the other one is for the VM subnet, and the final one is for the uh, service subnet. So in this way you can, you, you can imagine that they are uh, all connected to the same router so that the communication works, but it's also giving you the idea that you can have several neutron networks running inside the instances. So if you would want to have a driver that actually um, put different namespaces of Kubernetes in different subnets for more isolation and security groups, you would be able to do that without any difficulty. All right, so now we'll start getting to the real interesting part that can actually fail. So this is all in a namespace that I created called demo. All right, this went fast. So now what we're gonna show is that the pods are actually uh, being created. As you can see, they're still creating. What this means is that uh, now it's a time when there's the dance between Neutron and uh, the, so the, Kubern the Courier Controller, Kub Kubernetes API, and so on. And this, as I said before, with that graph, with the pulling, goes much faster. And it creates a support, so we're gonna show how the supports are actually being created. And this is something interesting that usually, if you have tried courier, you will see that the device owner is usually compute colon courier, just like you have compute Nova. But when you create a, a trunk port and you put support, what actually happens is that uh, the trunk ports override the name that you put for the device owner, so they put trunk ports. And as you can see here, like you, we have the front end, uh, it already has an IP of the subnet, the slave, and so on. All right. 
And yeah, one, one useful thing for the, the, that I think is quite powerful for, for those managing uh, these environments is that we have deterministic names for the pods so that you can find your pod when you're doing OpenStack port list. So this gives you visibility even in this case where the pods are running inside virtual machines. Right, so this is just to show that um, the, the Kubernetes site gets reported from CNI, the right information about the IP addressing that, that uh, Neutron and Courier did for it. Just to confirm. <laughs> All right, so let's look at the, at the service side of things. And here I'll apologize for not using OpenStack common line interface, but this is because it doesn't support load balancer yet. Uh, so we had to use Neutron for uh, the Neutron all CLI for it. So you're going to see a lot of this is deprecated messages. So we check the services. We see that they are created. The cluster IP, of course, you have to make sure when you make such deployment that the cluster uh, subnet range that you give Kubernetes and the one that you create in Neutron is the same, otherwise uh, you're going to uh, have a lot of fun. Another important aspect that I want to remind people because uh, I've fallen into this trap before is that uh, Kubernetes, when you give it the, the cluster IP range, it doesn't allow you to give it anything other than a CIDR. So you cannot say, okay, just reserve this IP for the router of, the, of this uh, subnet. So make sure that the router port that you put on it is on the last IP. So in this case, I think I have it on, well, on 254 of the last, of the last part of the subnet, just, just so you're careful. Uh, some people that want to be extra careful, they create a, a, a fake service uh, definition with the IP of the router so that uh, Kubernetes will not allocate it. Because in the pod case, we allocate the IPs and we report them, but on the service case, it is Kubernetes who demands the IPs. Because uh, when you define a service, it is your prerogative to define the IP that you want for that service. So Kubernetes is right in doing things that way. So you can see that the front end has a single uh, IP. And what we're going to do is uh, check that the load balancers were actually created and that it has the members. Right. So as you can see, uh, this is using uh, HA proxy, and uh, I see that I have an old front end from a previous demo run <laughs> that I probably aborted before it had the chance to clean up. All right. So then the listeners, it will probably also have an extra one. From I oh know this this one was cleaned up. Uh, all right. So as I said, this is playing listeners with anything. Also. Pay attention that it's a deterministic name, namespace a slash name of the uh, of the service, so it's easy then to to find out the stuff. And then the pools. All right. Okay, so we have the demo front end. So now what we're going to do is to use the Kubernetes uh, API to uh, scale the deployment. And, and as I said before, like with, with Kubernetes controller, we'll do is just check that there is a difference between the, uh, the endpoints it knows about and, uh, and the pool members. And uh, it will create both uh, the, the port and it will also add it to the member list. Right, you can see that there is a, a new one. I don't, I, uh, right now I don't know which is the new one and which is, oh yeah, the 09 is the new one. Five minutes, five minutes. Okay. All right, and hopefully the member list will already be there. Yeah, it's already updated. So now uh, what we'll do is to verify that uh, the pods can talk 
of, of one service can talk to other services. So let's get the IP of the uh, front end service. Okay, so it's 172, 30, 194, and 45. And we will just ping it from another one, which is the simplest test that we could do. Good, that's always good when it works until this step. So as you can see, this is running OVS, so the, fir the, the first ping takes longer than the, than the rest because it has actually to go to the user space and install the flows. And now, well, what we will try is the actual application, so let's hope that it all works fine. Uh, in order to do that, since this is running on a server that is on my company VPN network and I don't even know what it runs, uh, I'm gonna have to assign a floating IP to it. Ah, I've made a mistake. Okay. Maybe I'll have to do this, this part by hand. Right. Um, yeah, we're short on time. Okay, so I'm gonna put this part out of the, of the video because I'm being told that I'm out of time. Let's just move to it. Uh, yeah, so floating IP list. Uh, and then you can see here that I had a, a, a free floating IP that I had to assign. And here I had the, the port. So you can just take the port of, uh, of the service, of the, of the VIP, and just assign it like that. Okay, so once it is associated, we can already go to the guestbook application. This is the floating IP that I assigned there in the in the search bar, uh, and then what I try to put is let's go Celtics to see if, if they manage to win tonight. Uh, and as you can see, the application works, and now what we're gonna show is uh, how when you delete the cluster, the resources are cleaned up. So let's, do, I, do we have time or sp I speed it up? Okay, well, so I'm, I use the label selectors to delete the, the resources, and you can see here that the deployment and the services are being deleted, and now what we're gonna see is that when we do an OpenStack port list, very fast it deleted four of the ports there. One was still being deleted, but it eventually uh, all gets deleted, and the load balancers are all gone. So thank you for watching the demo, and if you have any question, please uh, go ahead, go to the microphone and just ask us. Sorry? All right, right, yeah, we have, uh, I, I forgot that we have actually some uh, slides about future uh, uh, features. So we have ingress support, policy support coming up, uh, then the resource management means this pooling that I was talking about, so this will be sped up. And then uh, improvements, we want to split the CNI into a daemon and uh, an executable, so the daemon will be able to keep already information about what's going on, so no, if you imagine that you have a lot of worker nodes all connected to the same Kubernetes server, so, uh, and all of them get a lot of pods scheduled, that's a lot of connections happening to the Kubernetes API, and it would be more load, so we're gonna reduce that by having a daemon, and then to have HA for the controller. So we would like you to join us, even if you're an operator, or even if you're a developer, just everybody has things to contribute, even if it's just requirements or feature requests. Uh, bring them up on IRC or on the mailing list, and here you can uh, see some blog post that uh, helps you get started trying the nested feature. As I said, I'm gonna tweet soon about some other uh, way of doing it with Qubadm and so on. And uh, yeah, this was uh, the, the old slide for the, for the services uh, for some other demo that we had prepared. Uh, and so if you have some questions, maybe we have some time for it, otherwise you can catch us afterwards. All right, so thanks a lot, uh, and hope to see you soon.